I hope that somewhere out there, relatives that I would never get to know or keep in my life would have figured out at some point that there's something wrong when you don't want to be in the same room as your father. When people call someone a wife or a son, and those terms probably don't apply compared to what is missing from these relationships that other people might be forgiven and might not, knowing nothing about nor empathizing with at all, and how completely isolating and doom-laden it is for my mom to be in a room with people, his family or hers, and to be in the room with someone who had a sadistic and psychotic disdain for her as a human being. And at best, could build a kind of scarecrow-like image of some completely distorted view in his mind. His view of my mom compared to who she is, is like something you'd see in a funhouse mirror. It could only come from a deeply disturbed human being. And all of that, and how it felt, and what I learned about it over time, and how I'd like to think that no one in this world would blame me and my mom for not wanting to be in the same room with him. Even if we didn't always know that, even if at some point we were unable, for various reasons of, of youth or infancy or infirmity, of fully understanding why we probably shouldn't have wanted to be in the same home or room with my father, right? That this wasn't a real wife-husband situation. This wasn't a real man-son situation. It just wasn't. It never was. That's the kind of father that I had, you know? And maybe that's an upset. It's nice when it was nice, but it was never something that anyone would really want to be around. It wasn't safe. That was, those were the cards we were, we were dealt, you know. And one has to be commended for dealing with it. There's, there's no way of dealing with it well. You don't come away from that thinking, oh yeah, you know, it's like, wow, I mastered that situation. It's never, it's never, like, there's no, there's no closure. There's no fine little, you know, credits rolling at the end. You know, I've dealt with that situation. It's a lingering hopelessness, a lingering anger. Being around a narcissist, being with someone who's capable of humiliating you and your children and just doing all kinds of sadistic things without remorse because somebody sustains some kind of crazy idea that it's worth complaining about. <laughs> Especially since nobody ever seems to notice except you. And he knows that because that's the way he likes it. That's the way he needs it to be. That's the way who he is socially and who he is privately work together with symbiotic perfection. I knew, in some sense, parenthetically, that my father was really big into appearances, but I had no way, if you'll forgive me, of knowing the, the depth and the danger of the depth of how far that went into some of the worst things about my mother's life and ours and his behavior. At some point, he painted the front door of our house a kind of reddish orange. I guess it was a British thing. You know, it was really important to him. I guess he'd painted the house a couple of times himself. I guess he had the right to do it. And it was nice. I guess it seems kind of positive. It seemed kind of special. No one else in the neighborhood did that. You know, and I think, I try to, I think back on it now, the dread. It was almost like biblical, you know? I think in a more serious sense, or just a serious sense, it represented England, it represented his home, it represented his childhood, it represented his family, his home, his way of life, you know, where he came from, and where his mind was always coming from in the way that we read today, neurologically, people experience certain trauma, and they don't feel it anymore, or they don't, they're not conscious of it, but it's a big part of who they are and how they treat other people. It basically warranted one line in Dr. Arthur Jean's book. We read it today. It was like, wow, it was the first time he actually started talking about how basically we could be treating in these books sociopaths. Maybe sociopaths would benefit from primal therapy, you know? Because I've met sociopaths that are into rebirthing, you know, really. Like, it's not like they're not into healing. I think most of the white people into healing on the West Coast are sociopaths, you know? They're always better at it than me. They never seem to have any similar needs that I have in doing any of the things that they do. And it seems like their spirituality and their recreation and their personality and their way of life, it just all perfectly go together, you know, with the fact that they're sociopaths. And how 
I have to be careful criticizing like things like Vipassana, you know, like this means a lot of things to white, uh, you know, 20, 30 year old, 40 year old middle class people on the West Coast and their yoga schools and their retreats and all those kinds of things, their healing retreats and everything. And it's like, they can have them and it's nice. And I will say that in the little bit that I've been in some of their satsangs or whatever, their white satsangs, you know, it, they're all very pleasant and peaceful things to do on the islands, you know, I really do. I mean, I don't take anything away from the organizations and you know, I don't want to slant and like, go and you'll enjoy it, you know, but, but I don't belong there, you know? had too many bad experiences with women. It's like, it's nice that they are very accepting, that like, I, I always like to be accepted, but I don't think we're the same. We're not on the same path. They're different, they're better, they found a different way, they're making money, they speak the same language. I don't. But I think they see me as a viable sexual object, or they did back in my 30s and 40s, not now. On the islands, anything's possible. <laughs> it's like, dibas, de plain, de plain. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's like, seriously, you put enough concentrations of lonely, fairly financially independent women who don't have families and don't want them, and people walking around in Thai pants like me, who might as well have their penis coming out of their crotch everywhere they go, signaling my readiness for copulation. I mean, I think my naivety attracted such women, but it's the only way that I probably could have gotten away dressing the way I was. It wasn't just shameless, it was naive. It was shamelessly naive how I would dress on Salt Spring. Shamelessly naive. One guy was wearing a tight shirt and some tie pants or something. Um, it was like a sleeveless shirt, you know, it was like probably would have been better for the gay pride parade or something. And this sociopathic white man who had this coffee store, he, was, he didn't mean anything. I didn't get mad at him. He was later friendly with me later on. I don't think I shopped there anymore, but he, him and his wife there make coffee. You know, they do a great service, nice place, all healthy. It's like a health food store. But again, you have the other aspect to deal with. And he says to me, you know, James, I was going by my note. He says, you know, I used to work in the fashion industry. Of course I knew, like everybody knew. Everyone knew everything about him because he liked to tell everybody all the time, but that's okay. You know, and uh, he said, oh, you don't say, Alan. You know, he's, it's my dad's name. He's like, so I can, I'm basically qualified to ask you the following question, which is, what are you trying to do here? <laughs> what is this? And uh, I didn't say anything because that's just me. I wouldn't, you know, I probably put my head down in shame and smiled and, you know, I guess that was that. And walked out with my tail between my legs. What am I going to do? I'm not there to do any harm. I'm not an aggressive person. Like, what are you going to do? I wasn't the only person they had humiliated. Most of the locals didn't go there anymore. But I guess I was just the last in a long line. I guess they were bored that day. I guess I was asking for it. I did have other fish to fry. You know, the, the white Qigong list, list, uh, uh, teacher I was, whose cabin I was staying in was a sexual predator, but you know, and that was kind of creeping up on me. It doesn't come back to them, it comes back to the prey. It was coming back to me. You know, and other students, male and female, were taking a crack at me on a regular basis in front. It got to where they would do it in front of her. They were like hyenas. It's like, I think white people need to see themselves through my eyes, how passive aggressive they can be when some woman who's dissatisfied with what she could get from you sexually without your consent is now turning into a kind of witch hunt in the name of unconditional love. You know, they didn't want me in the Qigong in school, in school but uh, an older white man who admit to raping two people was welcome. Who also came to the house and sexually assaulted me in front of her. And around two other young white people who were grifting in my home, who the next day came up to me and said, the moon told us that you should use your words that you have things to say, <laughs> which I really think now took, took to mean is I should have been more grateful for their existence and them stealing my money and defiling all my altars and humiliating anything to do with what belonged to me and stealing stuff and taking money and, uh, you know, basically just acting like two people who I suddenly realized had been sexually abused by their mothers and fathers. And I didn't get angry at them and they just weren't the sweet little indigo children they used to be. And I guess life had changed. And, uh, you know, we didn't have time to talk about it. It was just all very different. But that happens with a lot of white people. They just show up at your door one day and everything has changed. Or you get a roommate and the next day it's like, you know, you find out they're a sociopath. And 
you know and it's just sometimes it was just kind of funny that at that particular place how frequently it was happening and how there was within a day of them being there i was taken to the emergency room it's a lot of dis what i call disintegrating energy on top of the woman who was already stalking me from within the home and whose friends and other accomplices or other teachers were also starting to hone in on me for what oh no different no maybe then saying you know i'm upset that this person just humiliated me in front of the entire class for some reason you know they, they are aggressive violent people or this woman just came up to me and threatened me right to my face and almost spit in my face uh before we went into the qigong school last night and everyone seemed to be okay with that it's like their mirror neurons just went off you know and, and uh i'm pretty sure it has something to do with not giving her enough attention and what probably she's picked up is that from the moment I met her, I found her a little bit scary because I could tell immediately, I take mental notes, that she's very unhappy with that I didn't give her enough eye contact the first day she met me and that she was going to be on top of that. So she was already stalking me. Right? And this person, the Qigong teacher, knew that. I told them that at the time, but they just didn't care. You see, They're selective listeners. So, you see, I wasn't safe anymore, you know. The fact that they eventually kicked me at the school just tells you what kind of people they are. You know, the fact that I was willing to put up with that, to really just, there's nothing you can do, there's no point in getting angry, and then to just have trouble with the fact, with the little bit of anger that I showed. After telling me anger's not allowed in our Qigong school, right? And then being treated to a serial amount of sexual and physical hostility in and outside my home for the next several weeks, before she even kicked me out of the school. Right. And then when my father came to help pick up some stuff that we were storing for her, she decided as soon as his back was turned to verbally molest him to me about what a fucked up piece of shit he was. This is how these nice spiritual people talk when they don't like someone. I hadn't seen him in 20 years. He was 70 years old and he had already done stuff for her, but apparently he wasn't doing enough. She accused him of walking around and not doing enough while she was walking around on her two fat legs doing absolutely nothing except maligning my father. And I had spent two weeks packing up all of her shit and finding a way to store it for her, right? For nothing. Because she was so predatory, she would micromanage me in all kinds of ways. They really, just in certain spectrum of life, will just have to micro... She was just like my father, I guess you could say. And uh, came from alcoholic, predatory family, right? They're all trying to save themselves, but they're just too good at the magical thinking. They get into this mystical idea that there's no pain, and they found the solution to all life's problems, and their guru is encouraging them to feel that way. Now it's just having humility, doing what the master says, and getting your $150 every month for a useless, overbranded Qigong school that's basically just selling magical thinking. And what the master eventually admits to her is 80% placebo, you know, and he's just fucking raking it in and finding ways to get all these other affected sociopathic white people um, ways to do things for him for free that make them feel more special. As long as you can give them things that make them feel special because he's so magical, uh, they'll do more and more stuff for free and he can offload any responsibilities to anyone in the school while taking more of a symbolic role as the holder of the great Golden Jong tradition. Imagine if you could just send your photo to an altar of like 15, you know, rented dojos and people would send you money and they'd be looking at pictures of me in your dojo. It's like, this is Master Rain. We do all of this because he hold great tradition, long time and send him your checks now or you know, touch belly in the right way with special medicine. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's just amazing. I really got into it though. It like... <laughs> Oops, I gotta go. <sighs> I gotta go, I gotta go. Oh, having too much fun. You know I'm laughing, but it was dangerous. I got physically hurt a couple times around the school in an emergency room kind of way. This was a sexually disturbed human being. No doubt about it. And I needed to heal. And I was living with a roommate who was... Uh, came from a rich Maine, American Maine family who was also a sexual predator and brought nothing but male and female sexual predators into the house. And uh, I had to live with it. You know, I say sexual predators, I suppose you might say that 
that should be reserved, reserved for some particularly predatory people, but I was particularly offended by it. I was particularly unsafe, and there was a particular tendency for me to lose my belongings, my money, and my ability to sleep at night in my own home, and at some point, my ability to even eat food or have a place to live. And you start to, around white people, you start to have things threatened. You start to lose things. Life tends to go a little downhill. <laughs> and you don't notice it because you're a good white person. And really, they're all so amazing. And, you know, you should just be more patient. Because they all need that. They need, like, a patient parent who can just take all of their interesting eccentric behavior. You know? They just don't see things. You know, you learn that people have blind spots. And these people have a lot of them. And they overlap in many areas where you see me losing things with no explanation, <laughs> you know? And uh, you also can reflect quite clearly that none of them respect you. None of them give a shit about you whatsoever. All you are is something that they can get from you and from anybody and people like you. This is no, these are not forever relationships. Yeah. The only people who ever came to that house other than my mother who had any honor were a native woman and a native man. That's on separate occasions. What pleasant people who just, wow, I mean, they're like so sacred, so honorable, so humble, so pleasant. They would never hurt me, they would never steal something from me. The accusation of which would be me committing a felony. This is how untouchable such people are and should be. Truly honorable people. I won't say their names, but I know them. And I offer that to them as I recall all the kindness that they've done to me. But the nicest people, nicest people I've ever known were native people that I was lucky enough to cross paths with. And that's, you know, that's something that a man holds quite dearly. I haven't known a lot of honorable people in my life, starting with my own father, so, you know. And it's not like I should have native friends or that's something I'm holding on for because I'm not native. You know, but I try to make my way of honoring as not to need more, just to make as good of use of it, respect it, you know, respect that they saw something in me. You know, and the strange thing is that they all let me know that I was sacred. They all let me know that I was a good spirit. They just make you feel that way. White people can't do that. They've lost that ability. They can do it for children, maybe, with a film, but they can't do it for other people. Other, you know, I wonder sometimes if their animals ever really looked them in the eyes or, and see anything looking at them. If anything, it jolts the mind a little bit. When white people stare into my eyes, or when they do stare into my eyes, they never mean anything good. You know? It's like they're wild eyes. You ever seen a wild-eyed person? It's like, whew. it. I know, apparently it's not good. <laughs> In case you're wondering, I found out from recent experience, uh, you know, what does a man's need? You know? I don't have to worry about an angry God, though. I just worry about angry women. That's, that's worse. You know? Angry God is just ineffable. These people, like, they'll physically make you lose sleep at night. <laughs> 